The temple he stands in is carved out of the mountain with exquisite details. I must have found the remains of an extraterrestrial world, he exclaims. The young boy serving as his guide lights a candle and answer, It's never aliens, Mr. Smith. It never is. Welcome to Digging Up Ancient Aliens. This is the podcast where we examine the TV show Ancient Aliens. Do the claims hold water to an archaeologist or are there better explanations out there? I'm your host Frederick and this is episode 25. And this will be a quite odd one for sure since it's actually not that too crazy. This is one of those rare moments we have uh, where we actually see some decent documentary making. But don't worry, we, we will find some strange claims for you and investigate what's the, what the show actually leaving out. And this episode will focus on holy places and will take us on a tour between Israel and Palestine, Saudi Arabia, India, Ethiopia and Syria. I think you can figure out some of the locations quite quickly here. Some others you might struggle with. Let's see if you manage to guess them all at the end. And I'm recording this episode not long after attending the QED convention of 2022 in Manchester, England. It was a brilliant experience and the organizers uh, did a wonderful planned event with many exciting talks, panels. And I had a lot of meaningful and fun interactions with a lot of people during the weekend. And I... If you want to attend a skeptical or skeptic conference, this is one I genuinely would recommend you to. I did one speech on Friday during an event by the skeptics in the pubs. And it should be on VOD on the Twitch for a few more days. I'll link it in the show notes and it should be up on YouTube later on. And I will notify you if when that happens. (laughs) Then I also got some feedback from listener Mike, who caught that I said that the Great Sphinx is made of sandstone. What I was supposed to write and say was limestone. I guess I was thinking a little bit too much about sand and somehow got it mixed up. It's fixed in the show transcript. Mike also highlighted that the sleeping prophet's name is probably pronounced Kaisi. Good catch, Mike. Thank you for helping out to create a great resource to, you know, find information about misinformation. And with that in mind, remember that you find sources, resources and reading suggestions on our website, diggingupancientaliens.com. There you will also find contact info if you notice any mistakes or have any suggestions. I just want to highlight that if you see something, please add a good source if it's something a bit major. And if you like the podcast, I would appreciate it if you left one of those fancy five-star reviews I've heard so much about. Now that we have finished with our preparations, let's dig into the episode. So we start this episode on the Temple Mound, and there's nothing to Croatia actually for quite some time here. The Temple Mound is important for the Abrahamic religions. The big three within this category are of course Judaism, Christianity and Islam. Ancient aliens actually do a decent part of TV documentary here and if some uh, if uh, some archaeologists did some guerrilla editing almost, but um, so far, so good. Now, if you're not too familiar with the Temple Mound, I, it's not to overstate that this is a place among the most holiest place on earth for especially the Jewish people. The Temple Mound is believed to be a Mount Moriah or Moria from Genesis 22, where Abraham bound Isaac. It's also the location of Solomon's Temple which we will get to in just a moment and of course well not maybe the universe origin but at least the earth origins and this stems on the idea that a stone called the foundation stone located inside the dome of the rock today 
is thought to be the location where God stood or, you know, interacted with. It's also this rock that's supposed to be the Holy of Holies inside Solomon's temple. According to tradition, the first temple was completed during the reign of Solomon, somewhere in the 10th century BCE. The location of the temple was first acquired by King David for a price of 50 pieces of silver. The location was, according to scriptures, a threshing floor. And a threshing floor is where a farmer separates the cereal from the stalks, if you didn't know that. But King David was not allowed to build the first temple since he had spilled too much blood, according to God. It's a bit unfair since most of it was on God's order. Anyway, the task then fell up on uh, David's son Solomon. I'm not sure if the show by accident mis- mix up Mount Moriah and Mount Sinai, but we get the following quote from Van Daniken. In the Bible, you read about the Ark of the Covenant. Moses was ordered to go to the Holy Mountain, and the Lord gave Moses instruction to construct the Ark of the Covenant. As we know later, the Ark of the Covenant was something very, very dangerous. Now, the temple was mainly built to store Ark of the Covenant, replacing the tabernacle used since Egypt. In the show, they focus a lot on the fact that the only the high priest was allowed inside the Holy of Holies. And this is true, the high priest was the only one allowed inside and then only during Yom Kippur to make the required offerings. To become a high priest, we learn in Leviticus 21 that you need to be, for example, free of blemishes, don't have a crooked back or have anything too long. Not sure what you mean by the last part, but... Um, Feel free to fill it out as you please. So from Solomon's temple we move toward more magical items that was, according to legend, possessed by King Solomon. Now we will have a little confusion since Ancient Aliens is trying to handle written sources. The narrator claimed that in the Talmud there is a passage about Solomon possessing a magic ring with the seal of Solomon upon it which today is known as the Star of David. When possessing the ring, the owner could control demons, according to the show. And the Talmud is an important document within Judaism and is the source for Jewish law and theology. Usually when referring to the Talmud, we're talking about a collection of writings within the Babylonian Talmud. But you could also refer to the Jerusalem Talmud or the Sixth Order of Mishnah. Within, we find two sections, a written compendium of the Oral Torah and the Gemara. The later part is an expansion of the Holy Hebrew Bible, containing later Jewish history, but also costume, ethics, uh, folklore, and many different topics. All in all, the Talmud consists of 63 tractates. You could also call them sections or chapters, but... uh, It spans usually over some 3,000 pages and it's a massive work, so finding a section without any guidance can be hard. But I did manage to locate a story reference within the Talmud, and I'm using the Korean Talmud Bavli, translated by Adin Evan Israel Steinstalt. If we um, head to Tractate Gittin, Chapter 7, and Section 68a and 68b, we find a story about Solomon and a ring. Solomon sent for ben son of Jehodiah, a member of the royal entourage, and gave him a chain onto which a sacred name of God was carved, and a ring onto which a sacred name of God was carved. So this ben is then sent out to capture a demon called Ashmedaya, and after tricking the demon, the young man captures it and brings it back to Solomon. The king then ordered the Ashmedaya to build the temple all alone. The story seems to be a way to explain the passage within uh, 1 Kings 6-7, where it's claimed that no hammer or chisel was heard from the building process, except that Men text mentions that the stone was all cut and dressed at the quarry. So I'm not entirely sure why they needed a demon to staple the blocks. But the, the Talmud then claims Solomon was tricked by the demon, who then usurps the throne while Solomon is doomed to a life of poverty. The first time the demon meets Solomon, they actually throw a stick on the ground saying, this is all that you will have left towards the end of your life. And it's about, you know, the size of a grave. So quite (laughs) 
foreshadowing, but uh, you can also find a more detailed idea of the Seal of Solomon in the work of Flavius Josephus, a Roman Judeo historian. In his work Antiquities of the Jews, we find the idea of the ring expelling demons, but within it is described as he put to the nose of the possessed man a ring which had under its seal one of the roots prescribed by Solomon. We don't get the specification of what the seal was, but instead it it talks about the wisdom of Solomon and that its roots, he used roots, medicine, to make the demon go away. And we must look towards the um, testament of Solomon to find a more detailed story that the show seems to talk about. This document is still debated if it has a Christian or uh, Judaic tradition. It namely contains elements of both of them. And uh, the version containing the chapter of the demon is within the Vienna Papyrus and it's dated to around 500 CE. And it's an old surviving text of the version with this part that we have available. And within chapter 18, we can read about how Solomon used the seal to call upon and interrogate demons. They are then set to work building the first temple as some sort of punishment related to their domain of torture. But the star of David since not have been associated with the seal, not until after Arabic scholars worked on the story. And it's possible it was when it was uh, then incorporated back into the Jewish tradition in Spain during the Moorish rule, that this idea of the Star of David being branded on the ring, because earlier we saw it was just the name of God, basically, or roots. So the story evolves through the times, and it's quite fascinating, and it didn't really research, didn't go as I thought it would go, so it was quite fun thing to dig down into for me but the ring would be some extraterrestrial mind control tool or whatever they call it It seems a bit far-fetched but solomon is associated with other magical items for example a flying carpet and the show claims that according to arabic text the wise king had a flying carpet made out of green silk that could hold the whole of solomon's army and we get um, Giorgio Sokolos here, who suddenly turns skeptic. Now, magic carpets, do they exist? Of course not. So what was it that our ancestors tried to describe in those stories? And David Childress, uh, to us now familiar alien, is joined in answering this question that it must have been a spaceship. Of course it has to be, or, well, was it? We do find the story in the Quran, uh, or the Islamic text, as the show calls it. But in most stories, the emphasis is on Solomon, or uh, Suleiman, ability to control the wind. We see in Surah 21, 81, for example, this, and the Islamic scholars claim that this section is a reference to sailing, not a flying carpet. But I find some mention of a wooden mat which still sounds more like a boat or a you know, float to me. Or maybe a boat as one would describe it to someone who has not seen it. We also have accounts in the Bible. First King 10.22, they talk about the Solomon's trade operation. So adding up the evidence and the fact that the show just make things up, <laughs> usually, it's more reasonable that it's actually about... Uh, trying to describe how King Solomon had so much success within his training operations. Because within the Bible, he do have, he seems to be more lucky than good. And the Quran explaining this, that he could control the wind so he could sail quicker back and forth, bringing his trade goods and money where it needed to be. And therefore... He could earn a bit extra money and of course this sort of power is can only be you know given by god or allah in this case we also get a bit of sir isaac newton here who is a man of science and mystery back then it was not uncommon that the scientific method included what we view today as a very unscientific ideas and method but newton's didn't really 
believe in the Trinity and had a fascination with the Temple of Jerusalem. He did in his writing have a portion called Notes on the Temple, in which he seems to have looked deeper into the temple. To Newton it symbolized a heliocentric description, where the altar within the Holy of Holies was the sun, and as the temple and the courtyard expanded, it symbolized different planets that made up the universe. He also thinks that the Temple Mount will be the place where the apocalypse starts. And with this in mind, it makes Bill Barnes quote rather strange in regard to Newton's work. It was very highly advanced architecturally, catching certain kinds of light, being very precise in its astronomical alignment. And the question for modern scholars and architects is, what was the level of technology available to King Solomon that allowed him to design and lay out the temple according to these principles. The Bible provides a highly detailed description of the temple in both 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles. Unfortunately, some of the terms have lost their original translation, making the measurements a bit strange for us to figure out. But the historian, archaeologist or architect doesn't seem to struggle with the level of technology described. It's more of a linguistic discussion at this point. Well, basically, how long is the measurements that they are giving us? And we also have examples of other Jewish temples that that we have found that sort of match the description given within the Bible, which means that it was not an uncommon measurement when they, you know, set up a temple. So Bill would be more specific in his claim for us to look into and the certain kind of light kind of things doesn't really make sense in the Judaic tradition especially when Holy of Holies is only open once time every year so um, with that the show seems to be finished with the Jewish side of the Temple Mount and then goes off on trying to shoehorn in Christianity but it ends up basically about the ascension of Jesus so he went up and since he went up alien spacecraft must have taken him I don't feel we really need to go into this argument since we have done it in the past. It's not the most compelling one. The Christian connection isn't as strong either to the Temple Mound. You have the story of the moneylenders and that, you know, Jesus' circumcision took place here. But um, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre quickly took over the impor- as the important place for Christians in Jerusalem. That's, for example, why the Templars used the Dome of the Rock as a living quarter rather than trying to restore it into a sort of church. And with that in mind, we head over to the Islamic claim for the site, or Al-Haram Al-Sarif, or the Noble Mound. And it's also important within the Islamic faith since it's today believed to be the place for Muhammad's ascension to heaven. Even if in the Quran in Surah Al-Isra, 17.1, only states that the site to be the farthest father's mosque whose surrounding we have blessed. And people have then later then interpreted this to be al Aska Mosque. The foundation stone has also been incorporated into the faith as the exact location where Muhammad stood when Jibril took him to heaven. Jibril is the Islamic name for Gabriel. But why have we really spent all this time on the site? There's not really been that many aliens so far. I will let Jordio explain this to you. That stone signifies the coming together of the kingdoms of heaven and earth. The problem is we've forgotten that whoever visited us in the past wasn't God, but it was extraterrestrials. So the idea here is since the site is square and the foundation stone has a godly connection this must have been a spaceport it's interesting how they can so easily rule out god as a spiritual being while still keeping faith within extraterrestrials the idea that it was a spaceport seems quite far-fetched and the construction of the temple of solomon is relatively recent why we don't see depictions of aliens in text or art in the area from that time why would he put a temple in the landing port? I mean, it was it the waiting hall? I'm not really sure. <laughs> it just comes off rather silly, to be honest here. But from Jerusalem, we travel to the next holy site, Mecca or Maka al-Mukahambra. The early history of this city is disputed. 
and we don't know as much as we would like to know about it. But by the time of Muhammad and the rise of Islam, it had grown into a local important place at least. A part of it was the trading that happened in the city, even if this is contested in some sources. But it was also a religion center where people came on pilgrimage even before Muhammad. Even if this also is um, semi-disputed. The chief god we know at least of the pre-Islamic Arabic tribe was Hubal. And according to the information we have, there were some 360 statues around the Kaaba. And it seems to have been a quite large pantheon, and we will get back to these statues a bit later. But we haven't heard so much strange things, so let Bill Barnes take the reins here for a little bit. Muslims pray in the direction of Mecca five times a day. So certainly as a holy shrine, it is the center of the earth, a heaven's gate where the opening of heaven takes place. And that's why it is so revered. Now, this isn't really too crazy, but a bit problematic. The reason why the Kaaba is holy is not due to it being some sort of portal to heaven, but because it's Allah's symbolic residence on earth. The origin of the Kaaba isn't really Islamic. The Kaaba was there with the 360 statues we mentioned earlier. We're not entirely sure how old the building is, but according to Islamic tradition, it was built by Abraham and Ishmael. There might not be too much evidence for that, but it's clear that Muhammad incorporated this very important building within the town where he grew up into his new religion. In the text, he's supposed to have destroyed all the old idols, but none of this seems to match Barnes' idea, and rather seems to speak to the opposite of it. And the show gives off some information about the Grand Mosque, the largest one, largest mosque within the world, and gives us a bit of information about the Kaaba, nothing that we haven't really mentioned up until now. We then get some description of the Hajj, the pilgrimage all financially and physically able Muslim should participate in at least once in their lifetime. So again, we have a bit of decent TV documentary here. We could actually learn something. <laughs> we then start to talk about the black stone located in the east corner of the Kaaba, known as the al Hajuru al-Aswad, or black stone. It's a piece of black stone fitted within a silver frame today and was part of the Kaaba even before Muhammad. And this is a tradition in early Arabic faith to mark places of worship with unusual stones. And the stone's origin is unknown, but some within the faith claim that it comes from angels or falling from paradise to mark where Adam and Eve should build an altar, where then Abraham and Ishmael was supposed to build an altar or something like that. It doesn't really have to add up because it's religion, but I think by now you're understanding that I'm a bit of an atheist here. But uh, the show proceeds with the following quotes. Might the black stone really be a meteorite, as many scientists and scholars believe? If so, what does that say about the historical and possibly metaphysical origins of the Islamic faith? It's kind of strange, really, that uh, the Muslims are all praying towards Mecca and to this black stone that's there. There are stories that the Kaaba and Mecca is radiating some kind of energy. It energizes people and increases their spirituality and health. Perhaps it's coming from this meteorite, this black stone of extraterrestrial origin. So we're back with Childress energy claims. Childress is sure that this is a meteorite, but the right answer is actually we don't know. Due to a number of reasons, including that the stone has been <laughs> desecrated a couple of times, the Islamic people has not really allowed the stones to be scientifically studied. And why would they then? The stone is very sacred for a number of reasons, none of them involving spiritual energies. There are a number of theories, though, and the most common are that the stone is natural glass, basalt, agate, or maybe a meteoric rock. We have an account from about 900 CE 
when the stone had been stolen and when it was returned it was recognized due to its ability to float. If this account is true it's more likely glass or some porous stone. In my opinion, not that it not, doesn't matter too much, so don't use it in some sort of scientific paper. It kind of looks like obsidian, if you look at it, carved, polished obsidian. I did find some geologists thinking it could be this too, but again, it's not on a you know, published paper kind of level on it. We then get the claim that the Kaaba lines up with three astronomical things, a star named the Canopus, the moon cycle and the winter and summer solstice. How could these ancient people have this advanced knowledge about where things will be at a given time every year? This is a bit simple since the building is square and the different astronomical phenomena is matching one of the different sides. So you just need, again, calculate where something will happen, mark it, remember it for later and then, you know, build a stone in that current direction. And we have the repeating that aliens mean angels or, or angels mean alien as we discussed in episode 14 with Tina Rasal. We also will leave the Islamic world here. We don't really get the clear spaceport connection here, but I assume that it was hinted at due to, you know, the mosque being quite large, where-ish, and all of that. Now we are taken to the mystical lands of India. A British officer named John Smith, I promise he's, he's real, stumbles through the jungle on the hunt for the majestic tiger. But he finds something completely different. A cave complex carved out of the mountain dedicated to Buddha. Or Smith claims to have found it when in reality the cave number 10 had been known among the locals for some time. It's probably his guide who showed him that. But you know, if you leave that out of the story it sounds more fanciful as British officer in the 1800s tended to do. Well, uh, we have again some decent documentary filming. Again, we are on site and we're actually talking with local guides. And we're not talking over them, we are letting them speak, which is, well, it's good for ancient aliens. The Ajanta Cave Complex is a Buddhist monastery carved directly into the rock within the Aurangabad district in the western part of India. And it is on UNESCO's World Heritage List and is a quite beautiful location. The site was built in two main phases. The earliest part is probably around 100 BCE and the second phase starts around 400 CE. And inside the caves we see different tradition, thoughts and ideas from the Buddhist faith represented. So in the earlier caves, such as uh, cave 9, 10, 12, 13 and 15a, they are, archaeologists are not great at coming up with names. Maybe that's for the best too, <laughs> but taking our history accounts, but they are not in order either. So don't be upset if you look this up. Uh, but 9, 10, 12, 13, 15a, we see depictions from the Yataka tales. These are stories about Gautama Buddha, native to India. Since Buddha can remember earlier lives, he used these lives to teach how to get to nirvana. So in them, Buddha is usually depicted as a king or an animal, a criminal or a diva or something else. They are usually a lot of different characters Buddha gets to play in. And these stories usually have a quite large cast within them. And they tend to get into different sort of troubles, but the Buddha always come through in the end and manage to, you know, solve things, save the day, and giving a happy conclusion to the story. And in later caves we see the depiction of the Mahayana tradition within the Buddhist faith. And another large tradition, we don't really see it within the caves, but it's called Theravada. And it's also the oldest tradition. It's usually, to most people, the one version that comes to mind is, for example, the dominant religion in, for example, Th Thailand. Laos, Cambodia, and of many more countries. There are many different uh, sculpted subjects at Ajanta. Many of the sculptures are of the Buddha. Uh, in addition to those sculptures, there are various depictions of other mythological beings. These are called Jatakas. These Jatakas show these previous lives, and these lives could be related to, say, the Buddha being born as an animal, uh, being born as a deity, 
or being born as a human. And this was Dr. David Efrod, who appeared on the show telling us about the Yataka tradition that we just mentioned. So to repeat, this actually sometimes is good information we get from this, which is a strange feeling. To be honest, we then have David Childress walking around on site. Other than that, it's not too bizarre yet. Compared to what we have seen in the past, this feels like some sort of vacation, basically. But we then get to the misinformation. It comes sooner or later. Even today, modern engineers are baffled as to how the caves could have been cut from the 70-foot-high granite cliffs more than 2,000 years ago. Since this is an audio medium, you can't really see this, but uh, you should go ahead and Google Ajanta Caves. I, I will wait. Go ahead. You, you don't mi- miss anything. If you're driving, stop. There's an exit over there. Don't Google and drive. Now, if you did as I told you, You probably saw at least the outside of the complex. You might even have noticed that the rock almost looks folded, like nature scooped some sort of soft serving or a bit of whipped cream. And that indicates that this is not granite to start with. And the fact that the statues are sometimes more pitted than a teenager's face also indicate that this is not granite. But the rock is basalt and it's a volcanic rock. And due to this, it's not as dense and hard for as, for example, granite. I'm not sure why they decided to go with granite in the clip. But as it's common with ancient alien crowd, they tend to exaggerate from time to time. And the caves were most likely excavated from top to bottom. That way you don't need uh, scaffolding and can work more easier. What you will have to do is to, of course, measure it out and then uh, work yourself down. And the worker used tempered iron chisel com- combined with sledgehammer and they likely operated in different teams. So one hold the chisel and trying to not anger his co-worker and the other would swing the hammer down on this soft rock. And the debris were taken away and discarded mostly by women and most likely as we see examples of even today, for example. Even though we haven't found a forgotten chisel within the caves, we do have chisel points that has been broken off. So, and the fact that metalwork has been around within India since at least 1800 BCE also speaks a bit towards this being the tools. And we have examples of unfinished caves showing us how they plotted and excavated the cave. And if you start to look at the carvings, the, you will also notice that they've made sudden changes and quite abrupt changes. And this is due to the soft rock not planning out as they had planned out the carvings, meaning that they needed to quickly adapt to still get the message across that they plan to present. That's why some, you know, different sides can have different measurements, making it look a bit um, not strange, but, you know, a bit off. It's not like, you know, in the church, everything is the same on the sides and, you know, you get... But the show brings back the idea that ancient people having advanced astronomical knowledge... And that that is strange. Unfortunately, it's David Efrod who brings up that Cave 19 and Cave 26 are aligned to the different solstice. Now, why do I say unfortunately here? Well, it turns out that Cave 19 is not aligned with the solstice. They try to align it, but the idea seems to have come too late within the building process. Dr. Walter Spink writes, The only problem with this wise procedure in cave 19 is that the whole cave was later wrenched toward a never achieved alignment with the solstice axis. But both cave 26 and 29 have proper alignments. A little fun fact here, we do know the names of the different caves patrons. So this was not paid for by the monks or by labor as some sort of offering. Cave 19 was ordered by Upendra Gupta, a local king, and the cave 26 was paid for in part by Buddha Hadra to commemorate a previous chief minister. And these two caves were created more or less simultaneously. Cave 19 was started just maybe two years before cave 26. One hypothesis on why Upendra Gupta didn't get the proper solstice alignment is that they tried to change the plane 
plan a bit too late within the construction. They heard that uh, Buddha Hadra planned to have a solstice alignment and they wanted the same, but they were a bit late in the work to be able to do that properly. And the workmen, they did their best, but I don't know. To be honest, we're not sure why they attempted this sudden change, especially when it was quite late within the process. Maybe it was pride, optimism, or the fact that when you have ultra-wealthy patrons who tells you to jump, you kind of jump. Now, being wrong about something doesn't mean that everything is lost. But with this in mind, it does make David Childress' statement a bit, let's say, weird. Now, this would have been very difficult to do itself because you're cutting solid rock from inside of a cave. So you would need some pretty high-tech gear in order to tunnel and, and build and chip away inside of solid rock in order to really be perfectly oriented to the solstice. As we saw, the precision was a bit off in 19, but the solstice do hit stupas in caves 26 and 29. Interesting, both also show signs of being changed midway to accommodate this idea. As I mentioned earlier, we have evidence of the tools and measures they used to construct the different caves, so children's claim doesn't really make sense in this case. But Jason Martel fills us in on how the stupa symbolizes Buddha's descent and ascend to heaven. If you have paid attention, this is the point where we should think rockets. Just as Jesus and Muhammad, I'm not really sure what the expert Martel did consult about this, but I have a vague guess that this expert was located in his mirror. Stupas are a common phenomenon within the Buddhist building tradition and are usually dome-shaped structures containing relics or a, and a place for meditation. These structures stem from earlier tradition of tumulis. Within Buddhism, it's believed that the Buddha himself asked for his remains to be enshrined within eight stupas. When his disciples asked what a stupa was and how it looked, Buddha put down his robe on the ground and put his begging bowl over it. The stupa sense evolved and changed a bit depending on country and culture. But as you note, again, it's quite far away from what we're presented, by, uh, presented with by Martel. And to close this section out, we have white guys trying to explain another culture poorly. Or well, if they can't understand it by just looking at it, then it must have been aliens involved. The ancient astronaut theory suggests that if we find paintings or carvings of half man, half animals, that that means that those creatures at one point really existed because they were genetically created by extraterrestrials. So some of these mythological creatures they talk about are called the Kinara, usually depicted as a half person and half bird. And in most cases, these half bird are females. But they come in other short, other versions and varieties. Half horse has man, half bear has, you know, man, bear, pig. They are not evil, are said, but they are said to bring protection and well-being to people. They don't even come from the sky, but from the forest regions. Some connected to the mountainsides, though. But as we've seen with ancient aliens and myth, they have a tendency to rewrite it quite a lot. Well, it's time to move again. Let's say goodbye to India for now and head over to the dark continent of Africa, as I think many personalities in the series call Africa way too often. If you're unfamiliar with the rock hewn churches of uh, Lalibela in Ethiopia, you will not be in just a moment, because this is the next subject of our investigation. These structures are not built traditionally with blocks from down to up, neither are they carved as caves into the mountain. These churches are megalith basically carved out of the mountain and there are 11 of them in Lalibela but across Ethiopia there are some nearly 200 of them. Unfortunately many of them are not in the same good condition as the rock hewn churches in Lalibela. But um, the issue here is dating them. 
naturally. But scholars agree that the churches in Lalibela was created somewhere between 700 CE to 1200 CE. According to tradition, all these 11 churches was built by King Gebre Meskel Lalibela, who lived between 1181 to 1221 CE. But the narrator claimed that these structures are scientifically unexplainable by engineers, no less. What engineers, you may I ask? Don't worry about that. Let's talk a bit with David Childress instead. Anytime you're cutting hard stone, you're looking at specialized cutting tools, need iron tools. Even today, we would have to use power saws and grinding wheels and chisels. Whenever we hear the show say it's hard rock, we can usually assume that it's some sort of volcanic rock and be right. At least in most cases. In this case, the rock is basalt, a quite soft rock that's compared compared to other types of stone, very easy to work with. If you would go and look up this church, you would start to note that they are not exactly cut as the show portrays. It's a bit weird to hear them talk about how perfect it's cut and see that it's, you know, kind of crooked. But for not having laser tools, power saws and, I don't know, alien interference, the Ethiopians did a very decent job, or great job even. But, yeah, I don't really get how Childress thinks that there was no iron tools in Ethiopia at the construction time. It is true that ironwork arrived quite late into the sub-Sahara continent, but by the time of the construction of these churches, iron was in fact in use. And we don't even need iron per se to quarry rocks. As we mentioned in the past, you just need harder stones, basically. Also, Dennis Stocks, who uh, has done a lot of experimental archaeology, has shown, for example, that flint chisels can very likely have been used to cut very hard rock. And if you go to our website, diggingupancientaliens.com, and go to this show's transcript, you will find a clip of Stocks and a stonemason cutting rock with flint and this is not some sort of basalt stone this is hard rock they are cutting with flint tools we then go into the legend of the creation of the churches that include that the king being taken to heaven by gabriel there god sat him down and told the king that he needed to build these churches and back on earth the king started the construction with the help of angels who well took the night shift or according to bill barnes he took the night shift and complete the churches within, you know, a set amount of time of 27 years. That is a very fascinating story because, in my opinion, angels do not exist. Angels were merely a misinterpretation of flesh and blood extraterrestrials who descended from the sky with means of technology. And it's the same argument over and over, but he's not really expanding on it. Could it have been unicorns or leprechauns? Well, no, because we understand the sites nicely. You must just ignore a lot of history and research to get to Georgia's preferred explanations. And if you're familiar with these churches, you're probably sitting waiting for us to bring up Ark of the Covenant. They do bring it up in the show, but we won't discuss it in detail here. Uh, the story, short story about is about an Ethiopian king named Menelik who stole the Ark while visiting his father Solomon within Jerusalem. And then he returned home with the Ark and hid it in one of his churches in Aksum. And we will probably return to this story later on, but if you want to know more right now, I would recommend Brian Dunning's cover of, of it over at Skeptoid. It's called Raiding the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, let's continue this ride, and we travel almost back where we started. And we're in Lebanon and the historical site of Baalbek. And this city is some 90 kilometers east of Beirut. And people lived here for over 8,000 years. The Romans and Greek called this location Heliopolis or Sun City. But the site held little importance for a lot of its existence. If it did have any importance, it seems to have been lost to time. But it was not until the conquest of Alexander the Great and later the Romans that the site started to uh, substantially develop into the ruins we see today. Now we will tune in to what the ancient alien crowd has to say about the site. 
We don't know why Baalbek was chosen as this specific site. Uh, it may well be some kind of special power place. But what was originally there before the Roman temple was this spaceport platform that was apparently used for extraterrestrials coming and going on planet Earth. How these stones came to be there, why they were placed there, and specifically how they were transported into place. Because some of the stones are of such magnitude that modern machinery is incapable of putting them there. But somehow our ancestors were able to do this. And the main focus of their attention is three stone that the show claim weigh 800 to 1200 metric tons. And these are part of a retainer wall uh, within the temple of Jupiter. And don't you think they do a decent job of portraying it as if the Romans are building the temple on top of an older structure? Well, the first thing to address with the, these three stones, usually referred to as the trilatons, that they weigh 800 tons. Don't get me wrong, it's a lot of weight, they are heavy, but we don't need to exaggerate here, really. But three other stones on the site do weigh more, actually. The fun thing about these is that they have all been abandoned on the way or within the quarry. You know, they realized that this was a bit too much. Let's stick with the smaller 800 ones. We can do them. It should be enough. Now, Coppens claimed that we would not be able to move these type of things with modern machinery. And that sounds quite strange, but it's not a rare argument. Recently, I stumbled upon one who asserted basically the same argument and used a video of an excavator as an example. And now the excavator was struggling to be put a very large boulder upon a truck. It's just a case of wrong tool for the wrong job type of situation. And the excavator did succeed. It struggled, but it, it did do it in the end. But remember that we move things like the gas platform Troll 2 that weighed 1.2 million tons. So, you know, I think we can move a 800 ton boulder without huge issues. But why can't the Temple of Jupiter not have been built by other culture or an earlier alien civilization? As I mentioned, it was not a really important site for a very long time. And there's no evidence that Baalbek was on any tribute list or involved in, within the major wars. Neither the Assyrians, Babylonians, nor Persians make any mention of the site. A Roman geographer surveying the area after the Roman conquest concluded that it's mostly some farms and many robbers. Not really the powerhouse that would be able to move these stones, right? And not really the site where, you know, aliens would have built their no giant spaceport either the romans on the other hand now the romans had some excellent engineer remember that they did move obelixes out of egypt and built some impressive structures the temple is also dedicated to a roman god which is you know having the typical roman layout and traditional columns you've seen before probably these columns are not built out of one single block of stone or megalith, but multiple cylinder, and the, you call these drums. These will be important in a moment. Wait for that. If you were to Google the retaining wall, you would know that these giant stones are actually not on the bottom row. They are on the second row, so they have stones beneath them. Excavation have been performed tunneling beneath the bottom stones, and guess what we found? A discarded drum with a carving that can be traced to the reign of Emperor Nero. With that in mind, I think we can safely say that the most likely constructors were Romans. But why was it built? Well, it is a retainer wall, and if you go to the area, you will click quickly learn that soil erosion is a real and way too common threat here. Even then, the people living in Baalbek struggle with this problem. And the Romans would, you know, not want their nice, big, fancy temple to, you know, disappear in a mudslide. Therefore, you build this retainer wall to keep the soil in place. And the bigger stone you use, the more likely the chances of the structure surviving. But how did they move them? Well, 
We are not 100% sure about that, to be honest. There are multiple theories out there, some likelier than others, of course. Remember that both cranes, levees, pulleys and other engineering tools had developed at this time. But we don't really need those to get a trillion stone on top of the foundation. We actually don't really have to lift it at all, to be honest. Looking at the abandoned stones, they all tend to point up a little bit indicating that it was probably moved with rollers. So if you dig a lot of earth around the stones that you put in the bottom, you can just slide the tall stones on top of it. And the rollers using, you know, is used to reduce the friction. And the quarry is not very far from the site. And back then the area was at that point in history almost leveled. But you might ask, wouldn't that re require some thousands of people? To answer that, I say Thunderstone. Now, this stone is part of a monument in St. Petersburg, Russia, and it weighs 1,200 tons. And they dragged the stone 6 kilometers in 7070. To do this, they used 400 people, and the journey took in total nine months so if they can drag it and they didn't use animals or something it was 400 people in the winter dragging the stone six kilometers that's it but do the ancient alien have some lost card up their sleeves well yes there's supposed to be eyewitness who even wrote it down for us what's really interesting about Belbec is it's always been known as the landing place there's an actual text from Sumerian times called the Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh actually claims to have seen rockets descend and ascend from Baalbek, the landing place. This idea is in many cases attributed to Zechariah Sitchin, except it's not really his original idea. Baalbek is associated with aliens due to the work of Matest Agrest, a Soviet mathematician. In 1959, he invented some of the claims associated with ancient aliens. For example, Sodom and Gomorrah that we have looked at previously and other events. Even if UFO, sci-fi and aliens could be behind the mystic gods spread in the West, it was based on the principles of theophysy. And uh, theophysy is a religious philosophy <laughs> and it didn't really work too well with the strictly atheist Soviet Union and Agrest attempted to rewrite these ideas to fit within the Soviet idea and replace myth and religion that been used to explain things in the past. So instead of angels destroying uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, a nuclear device from aliens destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And maybe it was due to his doctorate but the his idea was the one that hold, took hold and ended up in the hands of Jacques Berger and Louis Powell. These two put this idea into their book of uh, called Morning of the Magicians. And it's where we get Zachariah Sitchin and Van Daniken's ideas later on. But if you go and read the Epic of Gilgamesh that they refer to, you will have a ha hard time finding the passage Jason reference. That's because if you read the passage, you don't really get a feeling of rockets. Go to tablet 4 and then skip to when Gilgamesh wakes up from a dream. Did you not touch me? Why am I so disturbed? Did a god pass by? Why are my muscles trembling? Enkidu, my friend, I had a third dream, and the dream I had was deeply disturbing. The heavens roared, the earth rumbled. Then it became deathly still, and the darkness loomed, and a bolt of lightning cracked, and a fire broke out, and where it kept thickening, there reigned death. Nowhere there is a name or a town, and as for the translation, well, since it's Sitchin's translation, you, you might suspect it's just a bit off. And the Baalbek does not really translate to landing place, no matter how you really twist and turn it. Uh, but Lord of Becca works a lot better and is more commonly accepted. So at the end of the day, is there any room for aliens to be involved in any of these sites? No, not really, as we have seen the archaeological, historical and most other records and are more than well written for us to not need an alien interference in them. 
people have been able to do incredible things for millennia. And even if we don't know a few things about it, we know enough to relo- rule out aliens, gods, or whatever. We should give our ancestors the credit they deserved when they have built these magnificent things. The ancient alien armies boils down to basically, I kind of think it looks like a landing pad and therefore it is type of idea. Yeah, I'm not really by it. Next time, we will spend almost all our time in the Americas and look into a rather strange claims. Could it be that the USA's founding fathers hide something from us? Could it be that the revolution and democracy were not resting on Greek philosophy but on alien intervention? Maybe. But till then, remember to leave a positive review anywhere you can, such as iTunes, Spotify or to your friend, that's maybe most helpful. I would also recommend you to visit diggingupancientaliens.com to find more info about me and the podcast. You can also find me on social media sites. If you have comments, questions, suggestions, or just want to write an email in all caps to get rid of all that anger, you can find my contact info on the website. And you, of course, find all the sources, resources used to create this podcast there. And you will also find further reading suggestions if you want to learn more about these subjects we bring up. Sandra Martelur created the intro music and our outro is by the band called Trollscrew, who sing their song Tinfoil Hat. Links to both of these art- artists can be found in the show notes. Until next time, keep shoveling that science. Men jag skyddar mig för jag har folie här. Och så säger ni så det är en galen fantasi. Att jag manipulerar oss med telepati. Ni tycker att vi har redan här besatt. Men jag skyddar mig för jag har Thank you for tuning in and listening to this episode. Remember that we have a subscription going on. You can become a patron or other subscriber for as little as $2.50 per episode. Go to diggingupancientaliens.com slash support. That is, go to diggingupancientaliens.com slash support to read more information and sign up right there.